So I wonder if you have heard of the words chronos and kairos. Chronos is the time that most likely you are in in this moment as we sit together. Perhaps you are edging, God willing, on the edge of kairos. But chronos is our time, the digital time, the calendars, the to-do lists, the time that we need to keep track of because we might be running late somewhere or something needs to be done. Kairos, on the other hand, is God's time. I think a perfect example of this comes in Genesis 1, where our need for chronos requires us to say on day one, this was created. On day two, that was created. And then it continues until day seven when God rests. And some take this literally, that this is one, two, three, four, five, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But is it? Kairos is that time, and we have all experienced it at some point in our life, that time when time stops being itself, when we experience a separation from our calendars, when we don't need to look at our watch anymore, when we think perhaps it's only been minutes, but hours have transpired, or vice versa, we think it's been minutes and we've actually been at it for a long time. Kairos is a time that is longer than us. And I guess I was brought to this thought, and I don't know if I can show you, by this rock here. I'm in Maine today, and this rock is made up of so many other rocks that it must have picked up in geologic time. I mean, I wonder what all those other little stones pressed within it, what stories they might have. Because in Kairos, our life is but a blink in God's eyes. Kairos, when we can touch it, is it a time that allows us to feel God's presence with us. It is perhaps what Jesus experienced when he would withdraw to the mountain or the wilderness. It is a time when we refind our heart's center we reconnect, not just with the divine, but with all that the divine has created, such that we begin to feel the interwoven reality that we live within. In the world as it stands, we are getting far too used to being separated from this world that I stand in right here and right now. We forget where our food comes from, how our air is replenished, even how the gas for our cars is created. I read this morning, and I can't tell you the name of the book, I'll have to put it in the notes, that between 1950 and the year 2000, we have consumed more natural resources than the entirety of humanity before it. I'll say that again, and if I have to correct myself, I will definitely put it in the notes below. But I believe it said between 1950 and the year 2000, we humans have consumed more natural resources than we did the entirety of humanity prior to that point. And I think no matter where you stand on your commitment to care for creation, that has to take you aback. You know, we like to think that we have it all under control because our calendar says this. Because this morning I heard that in the United States, a woman turned 114. And since they were very careful to say the oldest person in America, I will assume that means there's someone older in the world. And so we like to think we've got it all together. 
but I'm not sure that that is the lesson that we are to take from here. I am mindful that in our Bible stories, particularly in our somnity, we are placed within creation. Not to dominate it, but to recognize our connectivity with it, to become interwoven with it. Why do we prioritize ourselves over the trees or the animals or the bugs or the soil or the air, which according to our own creation story found in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, they too are creations of God. How do we restore that connectivity? How do we remind ourselves of our need for each of them? I was going to see, say and their need for us, but frankly, I don't think they need us. And so if we are to live in this interwoven creation that God has made, then we need to wake up, wake up to the divine connection. There was a great line in the same book, which said, what would it mean that instead of praying on earth as it is in heaven, that we might pray your garden continues forever. Remembering that God did place Adam and Eve within the garden, a garden which he or she asked us to maintain, to care for, to be good stewards of. Instead, we began to imagine God as king, as father, as dominator, and therefore we, in God's image, as the same. Mm -hmm. Instead, I invite you to think of words of God as artist, God as painter, as sculptor, God as planter, gardener, sower of seed. Perhaps as we do that, we might live more easily on this earth and thus create a time of kairos, not just for ourselves, but for everyone. Finding ways not to dominate and to gain, but to live in harmony, whereby we are not selfishly looking at the world, but instead collaboratively and cooperatively looking at this world. I invite us to imagine a world like this, to figure out little ways to enter into Kairos each day and to listen to our heart based on what is brought to our attention in that time. So that as we live out in the world, we too might be co-collaborators as my favorite Teilhard de Chardin often calls us, co-creators with God into a world beyond our wildest imagination, a world where we dance with God and don't worry so much. Kronos versus Kairos. I would love to hear how you see the two, where you have entered into Kairos and what draws you back to Kronos. I know that there are real life needs that get us stuck in Kronos, but how? How do we through prayer, through time in nature, through silence, through time with each other, foster that time beyond time where we can laugh and love and be in joy and harmony with each other and with the world. Because this is perhaps where our scripture points. To stop thinking of us and other, not just as individuals, but as all of creation. 
for we are a part of this creation. May we take some time to reflect on this and to practice it. May God be with you. that I referenced earlier is actually Earth Honoring Faith by Larry Rasmussen. And it's interesting because I had borrowed this book from my child. They had used it when they were at Drew Theological. And I noted on one of the pages, they had read that quote that I tried to repeat to you during the little reflection where Rasmussen says, but the difference between praying thy kingdom come and thy garden continue is not small. And so my child had handwritten in the margin, what would it look like to reintegrate the Lord's Prayer in ecocentric language? And so I took that as a plan today and I took some time and I did that. So let me share with you what I created, and I encourage each of you to try the same. Perhaps we'll be able, out of all of them, to come up with one that, that might speak to God's greater vision of an ecologically sound world, a Garden of Eden that we might all live in. So wouldn't you join me in this prayer? Our Creator, who exists in and around and through all that is, was, and ever will be. May we stand in awe of all that you have made. We pray this day that we be worthy of the task you set before us to care for the world and each other. May we learn from your ways as we watch and listen to your created world. As we tread, may we take no more than we need, May we share all we have. May we give back generously. In our failures, teach us to do better. In the shortcomings we think we see in others, grant us patience. Keep us open to your wondrous ways and guard us from greed and self-sufficiency. To you we pray, the original artist, garden, and homemaker. Amen. May you carry that prayer with you throughout this week, recognizing a God that is greater than just the reflection of humanity, but a true creator where all life has its beginning and all life will one day have its end. May God bless you and keep you. Amen. So let us hear from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 1, to chapter 2, verse 4a. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. 
And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then he said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit within the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them by saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the faith face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created. Thanks be to God.
So go in the grace and peace of God. May God's natural palate cause your eyes to dance, noticing sunrises and sunsets, the bursting of colorful flowers, the generosity of others, the gifts of the songbirds. Go and be awe-inspired by a God who created it all. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing to others. Amen.